Aloha and good afternoon. First of all, aloha. Aloha. I'd like to extend our gratitude to all of you for joining us in this very happy and important occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I am Harry Ann Lee of the School of Communication and Information. And I'm Sang Hyun Lee, Professor of Economics, and uh, I am actually assistant uh, MC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do anything today. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so the first uh, order of business is we will present the Center for Korean Studies video. So, are you ready? This was produced by Jin Young Lee. So, we will, it was part of a much larger documentary series, and we will see an excerpt from it that includes some information about the center. Pengyoni Nomke Yon Uri Sonjudre Tamgua Hiseng. 그 결과로 탄생한 곳이 있습니다. 호놀룰루 마노아 산자락에 위치한 하와이 대학교에 들어서면 눈에 익은 한국식 건물이 반깁니다. 대학 캠퍼스 안에 한국학 연구를 위한 독자적인 건물이 있는 곳은 전 세계에 한국을 제외하고는 여기 하와이 대학교가 유일합니다. 하와이 그 한인 규모 자체가 이 북미에서 가장 크고 역사가 길고 그런 교육의 필요가 있, 있었기 때문에 그두 개가 이제 함께 결합이 된것 같아요. 일정한 규모의 한국학 연구자가 모이면서 이제 한국학 연구소를 설립하는 운동이 시작되고 그래서 1972년도에 한국학 연구소가 출범을 했거든요. 이런 한인 이민의 이 자료와 역사적인 어떤 성과를 이 하와이 대학교 나가서 세계적으로 공유하는 어떤 그런 허브 역할을 할수 있도록 만들자 이런 생각으로 좀 그런 작업이 진행되고 있습니다. 한국학 연구소는 한인 이민사 관련 컬렉션도 다량 소장하고 있는데요. 학자들의 자료도 있지만 이민 후손들이 후세를 위해 기증한 가보나 부모의 유품도 많습니다. 그중 가장 눈에 띄는 것은 역시 태극기입니다. 이 태극기는 장모에게서 물려받았다며 어느 하와이 한인이 기증한 건데요. 세월이 흘러도 색이 바라지 않는 광목천에 한땀한땀 누가 만든 것인지 기록은 남아 있지 않지만 하와이 독립운동의 역사가 고스란히 배어 있습니다. 하와이 선인들은 참 대단한 분이었어요. 스스로 이제 나라 이런 그 백성으로서의 서름을 딛고 서로 돕고 또 그러면서 스스로 조직하고 또어그 자기 자신을 넘어서서 이제 이 사회 전체를 위해서 뭔가를 해낸 사람들이잖아요. Well, my grandfather always said, and it came down through my dad, that the Koreans never give up. They never have given up, and they never will give up. And uh, so it was. Uh, Deep stamp within our foreheads, <laughs> so to speak. They've always been entrepreneurial, you know, and so they were able to get out of plantation work, which many of them came here initially to do, almost right away and began to build businesses. And so they have that legacy here in Hawaii, which is very, uh, very proud. Perfect. Thank you. And it's the diversity of Hawaii that makes Hawaii so successful. In appreciating and understanding and respecting each of the different cultures. It's just beautiful as far as what the relationships are. Yeah. And that's why I'm so very, very proud of the Korean's contribution to the county of Oahu and the state of Hawaii yes. as a whole. Korea from earliest times on was producing just masterpieces in art, literature, and it's often forgotten. And so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that if, if Korean kids in particular, but all basically everybody, if they can understand their past and understand their history, then they, 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 they can stand up to this. Even if, if they're being attacked, they can know that they can fight back, that this is not right. So my answer is empowerment. Study history and be empowered. Know your, know your roots, know how strong your traditions are and, be, and defend them. That's great. 
Great. Very nice, isn't it? Yeah. Please welcome producer Jin Young Lee Won to the stage. Uh, 네, 안녕하세요. 감사합니다. Um, aloha. Um, as you can see, um, CK has played such a big, important role in my recent documentary. Um, but we all know that um, CK has members and the professors of the CKS have contributed so much, um, not only to my film, but also to the community and to the um, world of Korean studies at large, um, keeping our history and culture alive for the past 50 years. And now I'd like to send my sincere congratulations um, for the 50th anniversary of CKS and many more blessings in the future. Thank you very much. So next, we would like to share a nice little uh, slideshow of the pictures of many people who are affiliated with the center over the years. So this slide was uh, created by my assistant MC. <laughs> Entirely. <laughs> and he has sifted through, gosh, hundreds of photos. Thousands of them. <laughs> so I just want to ask one quick question to him. So what was your criteria for selecting the photos? Smiling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, so apparently smiling was the only criteria. So let's take a look. <laughs> Thank you. 
It is so nice to see so many familiar faces. Some of them quite much younger. Okay. <laughs> Maybe more stylish too. Actually, we are missing the last slide, but uh, I mean, some of the photos are very old, but I think you prefer that way, right? So, so that's fine. Okay. Yeah, over the years, I mean, 50 years is a quite long time, and, you know, there are so many people who came together at the center for a variety of different events, sometimes parties, sometimes conferences, and just thinking back, it's just all very, very amazing moments. By the way, if you can identify uh, about 80% of the people, uh, please apply uh, for a membership of the CKS. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Professor Lee. <laughs> okay. So let me uh, ask Director Taeung Peck to come over the stage and um, give a welcoming remark. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to the Center for Korean Studies to celebrate the 50th anniversary of this amazing project that all of us are involved in. My name is Taeyong Baek, and I'm director, current director of the Center for Korean Studies, but we have also uh, many of the former directors and uh, colleagues uh, who had worked very hard uh, to make the Center for Korean Studies as it is. I'm extremely pleased to, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the center, but before doing that, I would like to uh, express our appreciation also for the indigenous uh, land and the people of Hawaii as well. The Center for Korean Studies is grateful uh, to have uh, thrived on, the, on this land for the past 50 years, and we will continue to be responsible the protectors of the beautiful land. Recently, we have heard uh, the sad news that the founding director, uh, Dr. Desuk So, has passed away on September 13th. We would like to express our deepest condolences to the family members of his I'm very sorry, but I could not introduce all of you who are VIPs to us. Uh, please excuse me for naming a couple of uh, names uh, here, uh, but all of you are so important to us. So we currently today have uh, Dr. byung An from Academy of Korean Studies. Will you please wave your hand? <laughs> we have a uh, uh, dean of Cor, uh, Peter Anad here. <laughs> Deputy Consul General from Korean Consulate Office, Sang Go. <laughs> Former directors of the Center of Korean Studies, Edward Schultz. <laughs> Young Hee Kim. <laughs> Sang Yeop Lee. We also have uh, many uh, Korean leaders from Hawaii, and uh, I recognize some of the faces. Uh, we have a Korea Times uh, president, Shin Su Gyeong, here. Thank you very much. We also have uh, uh, rep uh, reporters from uh, Korea uh, KB Apple TV. Yeah. I don't think I can go, uh, go on and on, but I'd like to uh, recognize the members of Center for Korean Studies. If you are a member of this center, please uh, stand up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And this event was not possible without the help of our supporting staff, uh, Courtney Oshirochin, Hannah Grenov, and Kwon Ye Jun, Shin Hye Eun, yes, 
And uh, uh, Professor Harrison Kim worked very hard to make this possible. <laughs> Professor Hedian Lee, and the president of preparation committee of this 50th anniversary event, uh, Sang Yap Lee. He ordered me to be short, but I have a presentation actually to make. So I will go over each slide very fast. The center actually uh, had been very important uh, part of the immigration history. The immigration of Korean uh, people on Hawaii started in 1903. That is the first immigration to the United States. And uh, it was uh, 102 people first landed in 1903, but uh, we currently have uh, 1,859,000 uh, Koreans in this country. And in, on Hawaii, we have 52,410 Korean at this time. Korean studies developed along with this uh, history. In, in fact, it started by uh, books written by former missionaries, which were followed by uh, scholars, generator, generations of scholars dedicated to Korean studies. Uh, help me. OK. And uh, the Korean studies in North America, starting uh, during Korean uh, World War II and Korean War period started to expand in 50s and 60s. And around seven, early 70s, the University of Hawaii had the most Korean studies focused faculty in North America. And they not only offer courses, but also decided to establish center. And they persuaded the Board of Regents and President and others here. And uh, the Board of Regents approved it on February 1st, 1972. Currently, we have more than 18 Korea Studies Center in North America at this time, and it's increasing. So tremendous change we had seen. But the start of this center is actually the start of Korean studies history in the United States. And we are the oldest and the largest at this time. And uh, they aspired to have a building. and. Uh, vigorously raising funds through uh, Korean side, state of Hawaii, and local Korean community. One third of which was donated by those resources. And uh, the groundbreaking started in 1974. Even then, President Park Jong-hee sent a cornerstone calligraphy, and it is attached to this foundation of this building. And a lot of uh, donations had happened at the time, and it's continuously happening even at this time and the building completed in 1980. The project started with uh, this uh, planning committee consists of five people, uh, Chu Gang, Peter Lee, Glenn Page, and Desuk So, and uh, William Hinton. And uh, the initial members of the center were 14 people listed there, but now we have more than 40 members of the center. And I am the seventh director of this center, and I'm trying very hard to fill the huge shoes of the my, uh, you know, the senpai, so senior professors, and uh, they they are still active and uh, making this uh, center so uh, you know uh, uh, active and uh, uh, successful. We have endowments and funds, uh, which are donated by many generous donors. We have a uh, uh, being given scholarships. Some of them are named the scholarship uh, of the donator's name, and uh, some of them are not uh, individually, but the Center for Korean Studies uh, create many uh, scholarships and uh, awarding them uh, each year. We publish Korean Studies Journal, which is top-ranked journal in Korean studies, and we publish book series, and uh, uh, those books are very popular in Korean studies area. We also do organize conferences, workshops, and uh, other events. We have a, a library on the second floor, and on the third floor, we have collections. More than 40 important collections we have, and uh, many researchers throughout the country and internationally come to study those uh, 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 literatures, documents, and photos, and other important uh, materials. Uh, 
Currently, we are uh, focused on uh, doing one of the projects uh, called the Strategic Research Institute project uh, sponsored by Academy of Korean Studies, uh, focusing on Korean diaspora study and Korean peace, prosperity, unity, and Korean society studies. Additionally, we have endowment uh, professorship uh, fund and uh, uh, every four years we create new professorship on Korean studies and currently uh, Dean Anad and I am working very hard to make the third the rotating chair professorship possible. Additionally, with all those collections, we are trying to digitize the materials so that we can share it with uh, everybody through our online system. In conclusion, we have seen spectacular development of Korean studies in North America, and uh, the Korean culture, Hallyu, had contributed uh, also the popularity of Korean studies. But we also are facing challenges. Next year, January, is the 100. 20th anniversary of a Korean immigration. We had done a great job in the past, but we are also uh, in need of a vision for next 100 years. We need to learn more about ourselves. What, is, what are Korean Americans? What are their roles that they should play domestically and internationally? What kind of relationship should, should there be existing between us and Korea and other part of the world, all those things. We, the Center for Korean Studies and faculty member here, are contributing for the vision for the next future uh, 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Director Beck has been working really hard to uh, maneuver us through this tough challenges throughout the COVID and uh, really have done a terrific job. So just another round of big applause for his work. <laughs> so now we will hear a few congratulatory remarks from um, various people. So let me uh, first, ah, the first was uh, to be David Lassner who's the president of the University of Hawaii system. However, unfortunately, he's out of town and couldn't make it. So instead, he was kind to send over a message via video. So we'll watch that. Ho'o mai ka'i ana on the 50 amazing years of the Center for Korean Studies. On behalf of the University of Hawaii, I want to congratulate all of my colleagues at the Center for Korean Studies for continuing to make the center a lasting symbol of our institution. It is a fantastic representation of the university's commitment to excellence in research, teaching, and international cooperation. And of course, the spectacular center building is a hallmark of our beautiful campus. Korea's traditional five colors that grace the grandiose building and the charming pagoda make the site truly distinctive. Every day as I come to the office, I pass the center with both pride in the building and humility at being honored to lead the campus at Grace's. The building is part of why UH Manoa is consistently recognized as one of the most beautiful university campuses in the country, and the Center for Korean Studies along with the neighboring East-West Center, are the physical embodiment of our success in bridging people, knowledge, and cultures across the Pacific. And the center has surely lived up to its architectural heritage. Its high caliber publications through the University of Hawaii Press are an intellectual reminder that our center is one of the leading institutions of Korean studies in the world. And I am always impressed by the academic and cultural events held at the center, which are a testament to the outstanding research and teaching of the center's faculty members and the superb management of the staff. I will always cherish myself the occasion of welcoming South Korea's President Moon Jae-in to the center last year, as he presented South Korea's Order of Merit to the families of two Korean women patriots of Hawaii Nodi Kim and Chung Song An, I was reminded again of the significance of Hawaii and the center in interconnecting Hawaii with the world. The UH community is truly fortunate and honored to be the home of this remarkable institution for the past five decades. I celebrate this extraordinary milestone with you, and I thank the center's founders, 
sponsors, past leaders and scholars, as well as my colleagues of today for the well-deserved success and acclaim of our Center for Korean Studies over these past 50 years. The future for the Center is bright indeed. Aloha. Thank you very much. Okay, next, uh, let me invite uh, Dean Peter Arnold, who is uh, Dean of the College of Art, Language and Letters. Aloha mai kāko, uh, nā hoa, nā kamana, nā kumu, nā mea ki pāpāo, aloha mai. Uh, Eia ko o hot mai kāne ana, ya o ko, no keia kāna lima makihiki la ho o manao. I'd like to welcome you all, students, faculty, visitors, donors, friends, and offer my congratulations to your 50th anniversary celebration today. I, um, I'm a historian, and so one of the things I appreciate is the um, literature put together and the essay put together by uh, Harrison Kim that gave background about the development of Korean studies at the University of Hawaii and the and background itself about the Korean and Korean American community, both here in Hawaii and on the mainland as well. And it's a remarkable story. 1903, the first immigrants arrived. As Director Taeun Beck just uh, went over with you, with a current population of 52,410, and probably that number has changed <laughs> since, since, uh, since it was written. Um, 1943, the first Hamilton Library, the Hamilton Library Korea collection began. 1943, that's remarkable to think about in this country. Of course, Hawaii was a territory. Uh, it wasn't yet a state in the United States. 1954, still a territory the first language classes in Korean at the University of Hawaii. You, there's just nowhere else in North America that you can find this trajectory. This 1954 commitment to language today has resulted in the best Korean studies and language program in North America on this campus. I just went earlier this month to the celebration of the um, Chosuk, uh, excuse me if I pronounced that wrong, uh, Harvest Celebration with the Korean flagship students uh, here on campus. And I was just stunned by the level of proficiency in the language by heritage and non-heritage students uh, and the achievement that this program has um, made here academically in the uh, teaching of Korean culture and language. And it continues, 1962, uh, Peter Hasu Kim it becomes the first professor of literature and language uh, here on this campus. That same year, um, East West Center completed its buildings by I.M. Pei. That's a very important year, 1962. It's the year I was born. But I refer <laughs> also to, the, to these other developments, of course. Um, and I was also really, really struck that among the five principles in the establishment for the Center for Korean Studies and this gorgeous building, and I agree with Prof uh, President Lazner that to me as well, this building is one of the great centerpieces of this campus. And I was charmed to learn about its design, its importance, its, its, its acknowledgement of traditional palace architecture, it's, you know, octagonal pagoda that we all love, and why this design was created, when it was created, uh, and it's all very, very important, but it's really, really centers this campus. And I was really struck by the five principles behind the establishment of the center. That included, from the get-go, a commitment to interdisciplinary studies, so that today we see the harvest of it, the fruits of it. We have specialists in the affiliate faculty in Korea studies in law, Professor Tayong Beck, in the humanities, in the arts, in music, in the social sciences. And that's deep and broad commitment uh, really um, singles out the University of Hawaii as unique in that regard. And the other commitment among the five was to serve the people of Hawaii too. And this center not only is 
grounded and scholarly excellence around Korea and Korea's relationship to the rest of the world, but also to the Korean American and Korean populations in Hawaii and in the United States at large. I was first introduced to Korea when I was 14 years old. I was fortunate to be able to spend a year in East and Southeast Asia and two months in Seoul in 1976. It was a very different place if you weren't born then, but it made a lasting impression on me, and I've long been fascinated by Korea, and um, I think we all are stunned by the remarkable achievements today, politically, in the business world, in the economic world, and in the cultural world. And anybody who has children, and my children are in their 20s, knows, who is American, that my children know more about Korean popular culture than I do. Film, television, music. The group BTS makes the Beatles look like some obscure European group, you know, from a small town in England. They're so globally popular. So Korea's on fire, um, culturally, politically, economically, and we here at Hawaii, thanks to you, thanks to your intellectual commitment, your political commitment, your economic commitment, your commitment to the center as donors, your commitment as students to studying the curriculum, you as teachers for being the scholars that you are, have made this center and this university expertise in Korea unparalleled in North America. And for that, I'm very, very proud and grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Arnade. It's pretty obvious that you're a historian. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And we, Actually, again, we, we are CK's idols. <laughs> All right, speak for yourself. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Dean Arnade, for your very strong and consistent support for the center always. Next, I'd like to introduce you a very special guest. We have President Byung Woo An of the Academy of Korean Studies. He flew all the way from Korea to congratulate us today. So, Please, welcome him. Yeren 교수님 소개해 주셔서 감사합니다. Aloha. Aloha. 방금 소개받은 한국학중앙연구원의 안병호 원장입니다. 여러분 뵙게 돼서 반갑습니다. 우리 하와이 대학의 한국학센터 설립 50주년 그리고 이것을 기념하는 한국학 컨퍼런스 개최를 진심으로 축하합니다. 이 뜻깊은 학술 행사에 초대를 받아서 축하의 말씀을 드리게 된 것을 저는 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 코로나 팬데믹 상황 때문에 무척 어려웠을 텐데도 이 행사를 준비하신 우리 존경하는 백태웅 소장님과 한국학센터의 구성원 여러분 그리고 이 자리에 참석하신 모든 분들께 축하와 감사를 드립니다. 하와이 대학은 미국에서 가장 먼저 한국학 연구를 시작한 대학에 속합니다. 그 이면에는 하와이에 이민 온 한국 사람들이 있는데 이번 컨퍼런스에서 하와이 한인 이민자들의 이야기, 특히 교육을 주제로 삼은 것은 매우 적절하고도 의미 있는 그런 결정이라고 생각합니다. 하와이에 온 한인 이민자들은 초창기에 엄청난 고생을 하면서 생활 기반을 닦았고 그런 와중에도 나라를 잃은 고국 사람들을 돕기 위해서 최선을 다 했습니다. 그리고 그 자신들도 독립운동에 헌신을 했습니다. 그래야 마침내 성공적인 이민의 역사를 썼습니다. 하와이 대학의 한국학센터는 이분들의 이러한 활동과 밀접한 관련을 맺으면서 설립되고 활동해 왔기 때문에 50주년을 맞이하는 감회가 남다릴 수밖에 없다고 생각합니다. 오늘 컨퍼런스가 이민자들의 애환과 성취를 되돌아보고 현재 관점에서 새롭게 해석하고 
의미를 부여하는 기회가 되기를 기대합니다. 한국학중앙연구원하고 이 한국학센터는 오랫동안 깊은 관계를 유지해 왔습니다. 우리 한국학중앙연구원의 한국학진흥사업단이라고 하는 기구가 있는데요. 한국학발전을 추동하고 그것을 매개로 한국과 미국, 더 나아가서 인류 공동의 아젠다를 학문적으로 논의하기 위해서 2006년부터 한국학을 이끌어가는 이 대학의 다양한 활동을 지원하고 있습니다. 하와이 대학은 2015년에 한국학 중핵대학 사업에 참여해서 5년 동안 아주 훌륭하게 과제를 수행했습니다. 그리고 그에 뒤이어서 한국학 전략연구소 육성 사업에 첫 번째로 선정이 되어서 선구적인 사례를 만들어가고 있습니다. 마치 하와이 이민자들께서 새로운 역사를 만들어간 것처럼 하와이 대학 한국학센터도 해외 한국학 연구에 새로운 길을 개척해 나가고 있는 것입니다. 한국학센터가 이렇게 세계 한국학의 중심으로 성장한 데에는 센터의 역대 소장님들과 구성원들 뿐만이 아니라 하와이 대학의 라스너 총장님과 지금 말씀하신 문과대학의 아네에드 학장님 대학 집행부의 노력과 지원이 큰 역할을 했을 것입니다. 저도 깊이 감사를 드립니다. 한국학센터는 한국학진흥사업단의 글로벌 한국학사업을 지속적으로 수행하면서 이것을 발전의 계기로 잘 활용했습니다. 한국학중앙연구원은 하와이 대학의 적극적인 참여 덕분에 대표적인 우수 지원 사례를 갖게 되었습니다. 이것은 한국중앙연구원과 한국센터가 상호 신뢰와 협력한 결과라고 생각합니다. 우리는 하와이 대학 한국학센터가 앞으로도 대표적인 한국학 전략 연구소로서 한국학 교육과 연구를 주도해서 세계 한국학의 발전과 공공 외교에 기여하기를 크게 기대하고 있습니다. 잘 아시는 것처럼 지금 한국 문화가 세계에 커다란 영향을 끼치고 있습니다. 그에 따라서 한국학에 대한 관심도 매우 높아지고 있습니다. 우리 한국학중앙연구원은 이 한류의 확산을 한국학 발전과 관련지어서 연구하려고 합니다. 지금 첨단 과학기술이 발전함에도 불구하고 세계는 기후위기와 빈부격차의 심화, 또 기술 패권을 둘러싼 대립과 인간성 상실 등의 복합위기를 막고 있습니다. 이러한 시대에 한국학이 글로벌 위기를 극복하고 인류문화의 발전과 세계인의 행복 증진에 공헌할 수 있도록 여러분께서도 적극적으로 관심을 갖고 동참해 주시기를 바랍니다. 우리 한국학중앙연구원과 한국학진흥사업단은 여러분의 활동을 돕고 지원하는 데 최선을 다하겠습니다. 다시 한번 이 자리에 참석하신 여러분과 이 기념행사를 준비하느라고 수고하신 관계자 여러분께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 올립니다. 저는 한국학센터가 앞으로도 무궁하게 발전하기를 진심으로 축원합니다 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, President Tan, for that remark of congratulation as well as setting the future agenda for the center to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, we had a dinner last night, and uh, he is a historian, and uh, he knows. Uh, I mean, the works of uh, Hugh Kang, uh, Yongo Choi, and uh, Ned Schulz very well. I mean, it's not just uh, him. Whenever we meet, actually, someone from Korea, they actually know our works. So we should be very proud of ourselves as members. Okay. Next. Um, <laughs> Uh, next, let me invite uh, Deputy Direct, uh, sorry, Deputy Consul General of uh, uh, Ko Song Sang Uk. Uh, 
Today, the Consul General, Seo Gin Hong, couldn't be here because he's out of town. So uh, Deputy Consul, who's quite new to Hawaii, is going to read the uh, remarks from him. Aloha, good afternoon. It is my honor to be here today on behalf of Consul General Hong Seo Gin. As announced, now I will deliver his remarks. Dr. Peter Anade, Dean of the College of Arts, Languages, and Letters. Dr. Ahn byung -woo, President of the Academy of Korean Studies. Dr. Baek tae -woo, Director of the Center for Korean Studies. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the Korean Consulate General, as well as the Korean government, I extend my sincere congratulations on the 50th anniversary of the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii. Since its establishment in 1972, the center has pursued its vision of developing and promoting Korean studies for half a century. Its status as the oldest and the largest Korean studies institute outside Korea is firm and solid with the most extensive research resources and more than 40 faculty members. I would like to commend the tireless enthusiasm and hard work of the faculty and staff, in particular Director Beck, for the center's unrivaled position. It is even more meaningful that the first overseas Center for Korean Studies was established in Hawaii and has achieved the great success to this day. Hawaii is the place where Korea's immigration history began 120 years ago, and also the place that has great significance in the history of our independence movement. I would like to acknowledge that the center has played an important role in researching, documenting, preserving, and promoting this history. The special link between Hawaii and Korea continues in the context of security, human exchange, and many more. Especially, the Korean way has been very popular in the local community, making Korean culture such as K-drama, K-pop, K-food, parts of daily life. And recently, uh, we also rejoiced at the multiple wins of Emmy Awards of the Korean drama Squid Game. I saw quite a few Hawaiian friends who regularly watch Korean dramas here. Taking this opportunity, I would like to mention that the Korean festival held here last August was a huge success with an estimated 35,000 visitors. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm certain that with this favorable atmosphere to Korea, the center will expand its capacity and forge ahead to an even brighter future as an educational research an informational hub for Korean studies. Let me finish by highlighting the close relationship between the Consulate General and the Center. I assure that the Consulate General will do its utmost to assist the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii. Once again, I offer congratulations to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Consul. Deputy Consul General, I'm sorry. Uh, please welcome Harrison Kim to the podium. So, Professor Harris Kim, another historian, <laughs> uh, is a member of CKS 50th Anniversary Planning Committee. Thank you. Um, so I had the wonderful task of writing and compiling the booklet that we all um, received. And uh, I just want to share some highlights from, um, from the book. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the context, uh, I was mainly responsible for the design and the lay layout. It's entirely uh, the amazing work of Hannah Granoff. So I really thank Hannah for working with us. Yes. Uh, who is also um, an, uh, an, an excellent student in Korean literature herself. Okay, so let me just briefly go over some of the, the, the gems and the incredible stories that I learned. For example, Hugh Kang. 
1971, he organized a conference that involved hundreds of people. And on the last day, the picnic lunch had 1,000 attendees. It's just unbelievable and probably not replicable today. His budget at the time was $70,000. That money with the inflation today is half a million dollars. Half a million. It, it's just extraordinary. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, Judy Van Zyl. She joined the university in 1971 and became one of the first Korean dance instructors in the U.S. And a white woman teaching about Korean dance in the United States. It's just a pioneering, pioneering moment. Young Oh Choi. In 1978, he was part of, he organized a committee that promoted Korean people's rights and also Asian people's rights. There was um, a common way of describing sort of CD reputable bars as simply Korean bars. And Young Ho Choi, he gathered um, the leaders of the community and um, began to protest and campaign against this practice, and eventually um, uh, persuaded the newspapers to stop using this term to, de to describe any uh, Asian American um, establishment. But more than that, what Yong Ho Choi emphasized was that the workers at these places should not be treated with um, discrimination. Um, so, so Yong Ho Choi, from the beginning, was, uh, was an amazing leader uh, within the community as well. Okay, um, Young Hee Kim, you know, um, uh, the first and only woman director of our center. Uh, and this is such a, a character of, of Young Hee. She uh, gives all the credit to the staff of this place. Without the wonderful staff, um, this center is, uh, could not have existed. So, so, so thank you for that remark. Oh, and by the way, um, everyone, thank you so much for giving me your precious words. You know, asking for a one-page essay from each of you, uh, it was not easy. And, and, um, and for, for you guys to actually um, um, kind of um, uh, meet that demand and send us your essays, uh, incredibly grateful for that. Okay, Gary Puck, um, he is um, grateful and really appreciative of the fond memories of the camaraderie of the people of the center that involved, of course, occasional parties and much lib libation. Uh, and Gary Park is always at the center of, of the fellowship and the camaraderie. He will bring out his piano, his keyboard, and play for us. Um, Christopher Bay, it is um, the, uh, the, 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 the extraordinary work of, of Christopher that has taken our journal, Korean Studies, to the next level. Um, our journal gets 70,000 downloads a year. This is by far the highest number within the field of Korean Studies. It's an amazing work, and, um, and we can thank Christopher for that. Min Sun um, from uh, Community Ecology. Um, you know, I really like her essay because she talks about how every time she comes to the center, she senses a, a kind of the Korean ethos chung flowing throughout the building. And I, and I really uh, appreciate that. And I think it may be true. I think there is something about this, this place. And uh, William O'Grady, our uh, linguistics professor, um, uh, of course, he is the foremost scholar on Jeju language and helped Jeju language become a recognized critical language by UNESCO. And of course, we have, the center has always sponsored his research, um, so thank you for that. And finally, David Krolikoski, he talks about how um, the, his, his, uh, his tenure here so far has coincided with the growth of popular Korean culture, and, um, and he feels that the CKS has a vital role here. Um, Thomas Osborne, he recalls a performance concert that he had in 2017 where um, there was a Shinawi performance, a musical performance, is a traditional genre of music that is entirely improvised. Uh, it's a fascinating genre. And Pyongwan was also part of this performance. And I really loved reading about that. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Yonga Park, uh, is she here? Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, she was the one who organized the Korean film series for several years. And one thing that she remembers 
fondly is the meeting the local community uh, who saw different sides of South Korea, for example. And she really uh, enjoyed that. Um, and uh, lastly, um, Andy. Is Andy here? Andy Sutton? He, he says the, the CK is, is, is fundamentally about its people, about the faculty, staff, and the students, and the community who really make it shine. So thank you for that uh, remark, Andy. Um, and lastly, so there is still a remaining question of who came up with the idea of, of, of modeling the, the center after a traditional building. It's an unsolved uh, question. And I could not find the answer. And I, and I went through hours and hours of interview. So one theory is that Hugh Kang came up with the idea of, of modeling the center after Kunjongjeon of Gyeongbok Palace, the, the main palace in Korea. It is also possible that it was Glenn Page who came up with the idea long, maybe a few years before that, while he was working and also living in Korea too. But um, um, Hugh Kang's influence was, was actually quite large because he was the one who began to talk to the ministries in South Korea. But Kun Jung Jeon, if you look at the image, um, has a double-decked roof. Um, and of course, our, our center has a large single-decked roof. So I was doing some research, and to me, there is a palace hall that resembles our building. And it's the Su Jung Jeon. It's next to Kun Jung Jeon. It's right next to. And um, it's, called, it's translated as the Hall of Erudite Governance. But before this hall was built, it used to be um, occupied by another building called Jipyeonjeon, the Hall of Worthies. And this is where in the year 1443, the Korean alphabet was invented. And so when I saw this picture, to me, Sangyeop, our center looks exactly like Sujangjeon, and not so much Kunjangjeon. You know, it doesn't have to be Kunjangjeon. Kunjangjeon is where the king sat and uh, met with the dignitaries, right? And that's not, that's not about what we do. We're, we're more about um, uh, the, the scholarly work and the debates um, and producing art. Um, yeah, perhaps, yeah. Um, but let, let me end here. Yeah, thank you very much. Another historian, right? Another historian. <laughs> Thank you, Harrison, for that. I know we are a little bit behind the schedule, but we are almost there. So the last um, item on our agenda is uh, presenting appreciation flags to our major donors. We do a lot of work at the center, faculty, staff, everybody works hard, but without these donors and their generosity, a lot of the work that we do with our students, funding students and giving them scholarship and also supporting faculty, it's just simply not possible. So Professor Peck, please come up. So the first recipient of the plaque is um, our dear Toki Lee Murabayashi. Please come up. Takili Murabayashi, with our deepest gratitude for your years of dedication, support, and contribution to the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The second recipient is David Bung Yun Choi. And today, uh, David Choi who is the son of Bong Yun Che and Linda Lennox, who's the daughter-in-law, is here too. They are here to accept the appreciation plaque. We also have a daughter of Dr. Bong Yun Che as well. So, uh, Snow, would you please also come? Bong Yun Choi, with our deepest gratitude for your years of dedication, support, and contribution to the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. 
Thank you. Next recipient is Roberta Chen. Today, Pam Wilson, who is the niece of Roberta Chang, is here to accept the flag on her behalf. Pam? With our deepest gratitude for your years of dedication, support, and contribution to the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you. And the last recipient is um, Professor and our founding director, Daesuk So. As Professor Peck shared earlier, uh, we are really sad that he couldn't be here with us today. But Professor Carl Kim will come up and receive the flag on his behalf. All right, everybody, um, this concludes the ceremony, um, the part one of the ceremony. And uh, I mean, in large part due to our efficient management, we are on time. And then uh, we'll sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming back to the second portion of the anniversary celebration. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we are going to present a panel. Uh, with the title, Educators, Stories of Korean Immigrants and CKS. So let me go ahead and introduce moderator, Director Taeung Baek, to come up and introduce the panelists and move ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for staying for this part two of today's celebration. Again, uh, my name is Tae Yong Baek, the director of the Center for Korean Studies. We are very pleased to devote our uh, special workshop celebrating this 50th anniversary to the topic of educator, educators. Stories of Korean immigrants had been a kind of a continuous uh, theme of a workshop and seminars in the past. Uh, when we uh, discussed the potential topics, uh, for this 50th anniversary event, we uh, immediately agreed that it should be uh, education-focused. And uh, uh, I'm very, very fortunate to uh, be able to secure uh, key speakers for uh, today's event. Today, we have uh, four speakers for this uh, session. This is Dr. Kili Murabayashi, President of Korean Immigration Research Institute in Hawaii had worked very hard to uh, make that photo exhibition and display of other artifacts possible. And uh, she had uh, selected photos and uh, materials uh, to display uh, for this event. And uh, the Kilim Rabbi, she will be speaking Korean immigrants' education in Hawaii. And then uh, Professor Mi Jung Park, Associate Professor and Chair, Department of East Asian Language and Literature, will speak about Korean language flagship textbook and uh, the work of uh, Professor Ho Min Son, who was also the, the director of this Center for Korean Studies. And then Mr. David Choi and Mrs. Linda Lennox, son and daughter-in-law of Dr. Bong Yun Che uh, will speak about the lifelong contribution that Dr. Bong Yun Che had made. As you may know, uh, Mr. Bong Yun Che, uh, former professor at University of uh, Berkeley, had donated uh, $500,000, which became our endowment, 
And uh, we this year had awarded a scholarship under his name, and his uh, uh, the profit of his endowment is already being used for uh, the Korean studies, and they will speak about uh, lifelong contribution and activities of Dr. Long Yun Che. Professor uh, Ned Schultz, who is an emeritus professor and also the former director of the Center for Korean Studies and also dean of the uh, School of Pacific Asian Studies, will speak about uh, education in the area of history and also talk about uh, professors Shu Gang and uh, Yong Che, pioneers in history education in Hawaii as well as at the University of Hawaii. Finally, uh, Professor Carl Kim, Department of Urban and Regional Planning, will be talking about the founding member and also the first director of the Center for Korean Studies, Daesuk So. So I will not interfere during their presentations. And at the end, uh, we can start to have a little bit of a question and answer session, assuming we will have time. But uh, I will just uh, leave the floor to the speakers one after another. Please welcome all of the speakers for today's event. Um, from early session, we all heard the CKS is the first of this, first of that, and you all know it's first, right? But actually, it's not an exaggeration that the foundation of CKS was laid by early Korean immigrants starting from 1903. I can summarize why it is so. Okay. Uh, just a picture. <laughs> uh, early, as you all know, the Korean immigrants started on January 13 of 1903. So next year, January, we'll be celebrating 120th anniversary. And from 1903 to 1905 summer, we had about 75 7,500, 7,600 immigrants came, including 650 women and about 550 children. And from 1910 to 28, about 680, about 700 picture brides added to that. So if I summarize the uh, Korean population in Hawaii, by summer we had about 7,000, 7,600. The first census, including Korean population, was in 1910, and we had only 45, uh, 4,533. Because uh, previous about five years, about 2,200 2, 2, went back to Korea, and 800 moved to the mainland. So we had only 4,600, including about 400 born in Hawaii. 19, you can see it, census slowly increasing. And you know, the today uh, we have about 55,000 population. However, the percentage-wise of the Korean population of total Hawaii population was never more than 2%. So we are very small, small, minor ethnic group. Uh, 1905 summer, uh, some leaders went to Methodist Church superintendent and asked for the uh, established school for Korean children. They pledged $2,000. That is $2,000 the present day, about $70,000 worth. And at that time, their wage was $16 or $20 per month. Yet they pledged $2,000 to establish the school. So surprise Methodist ch Church uh, invested $18,000 to establish the school. And we started uh, Korean 
boarding school for boys in 1906 fall with 65 boys. And that lasted until uh, 1980, but in between the uh, Sungman Ri came, this is the boarding school. They had a uniform, special uniform. But actually this uniform was made for the 1950, uh, earlier, but later on they used it for the 50th anniversary of the Korean National Association. So this, they didn't wear this every day, it's just a special occasion. First graduate of a Korean boarding school. Far left, Chan Jae Kim became an engineer. The second one is a medical doctor. Bandu Park, another engineer. Next one is a chemist. And Yang Yu Chan is a medical doctor. You know, Yang Yu Chan became the second ambassador to America. And Yang Yu Chan graduated boarding school and moved on to McKinley High School. In 1959, when Hawaii became the 50th state, November they had a celebration. And celebration committee invited the Yang Yu Chan to give a speech because he is Hawaii, Hawaiian. He is from Hawaii, so he was chosen to give a speech. Anyway, this is a 1911 grad, graduating class. 19, 1913, I'm sorry, 1913, Dr. Sungman Rhee settled in, uh, in Honolulu, and he became the second principal of a boarding school, and he changed the name to Korean Central School, being the center of Korean education and he changed the system from boys' school to co-ed. And this is the first co-ed education institute in and out of Korea, out of Korea. So it started, co-ed education started in Honolulu. This is a, they participated, Korean Central School students participated the 50th anniversary of K&A, okay? And, uh, 1915, he moved out of uh, Korean board Central School and he established the Korean Girls Seminary. And he even used the logo. This is the first logo used a tag of Yin and Yang. He was a Dr. Seungman Lee. It's a Dr. Seungman Lee's idea to use the tag as a school logo. It didn't have a badge, it's just a logo they used. Sungman Ri is way up here. It's hard to point. The back, I, I don't know how to use this. <laughs> okay. It was possible because the Korean community supported. With all the receipt we still have left, they donated a dollar, 50 cents. $2 and all that, because the Korean school was only possible with the Korean community support. School did not charge tuition, but they had to pay the uh, dormitory fee, about $35 per year, but even then, those who cannot afford the dormitory fee was waived, so it was more like a free. Since Korean community supported all the contribution came. Dr. Sungman made the financial report. This is one of the financial report left. Honolulu. Honolulu Hangu. Ho Hang. You learned something today. <laughs> and this is a Korean girls seminary who participated at a students parade festival. Uh, in 1917, uh, noticed the Kwanghamun model over there. 1917, Dr. Seungman Mi already used the Kwanghamun as the symbol of a Korean nation. Okay, so later on, 1938, Lilia Church was built. He specifically asked to put the Kwanghamun facade to the building. So that's, it started from 1917. 
lo and behold, the Korean girls' seminary was so successful. English paper every day, every week, every month. They even announced their financial report in the newspaper because Dr. Seungman Lee recruited the editor of an advertiser as a board member. So it was so successful, parents asked Dr. Seungman Lee to accept the boys to the girls' seminary. So 1918 spring semester, three boys came. So Dr. Seungman Lee had to change the school name to Korean Christian Institute and became a co-ed. And the campus, they had to rent because uh, the girls' seminary campus was too small. They had to rent a Leolani building, a Leolani campus, which was just closed at that time. A Leolani elementary school is still existing on Wailai Avenue. They moved and they, in 1918 fall semester, they moved and uh, Aliolani. They didn't even change the whatever name tag, so, so we still have the sign there. Uh, number four, from far left, with a white suit, it, the, Dr. Sung Man Mi. This is another picture. That wildlife school, the, Aliolani campus played a very, very important role in the Korean American uh, Korean history in Hawaii. Uh, when Hawaii heard, got the news of March 1st movement in uh, March 9th, 1919, they decided to celebrate the movement, celebrate the independence declaration. So they wanted to have a parade in the uh, public park, mayor said no, because he was afraid that there would be some kind of ethnic conflict. City council said no. So the Korean National Association came up with the idea. Hey, this is a private school. We can hold a parade celebration over here. So this is the one actually had a, uh, April 12th, we had a celebration of a Independence Declaration. Those who cannot gather over here, they all did it in different plantations. Wailua had their own, Maui had their own, Big Island had their own. It's April 12th, a celebration day in Hawaii. I think we still have that tree standing in the, in the wild. Go visit there. Again, Korean community supported the school. So they sent money again. Lo and behold, they have a fancy class book. So all the names and the graduating students. Okay. 1923, they decided to go to Korea fundraising because they were renting the Aliolani campus. They wanted to build on their own school, campus. So they went to Korea baseball team, and the girls was a singing group. The top picture is the Pagoda, Ho Pagoda Hotel. Okay. And the baseball team played uh, several games. Actually, because of that, 1925, Korean team came played in Honolulu. This is a... After 23, 24, they built uh, different buildings. Girls, girls' dormitory and the school office was the same building. They had to protect the girls from intruder. <laughs> <laughs> and again, uh, you can see the, uh, the girls' seminary, the logo. And uh, they used the girls' seminary logo, just changed the name to Korean Christian Institute, and had a Boy Scout 1919 Bas uh, basketball team. Okay, that's a regular regular education. This uh, boarding school, uh, girls' seminary, is Christian Institute, all certified the school. So after they graduated, they could move on to McKinley or some other high schools or move to the mainland high schools. 
So at that time, they didn't have the accreditation system, but certified certifying system, so they were certified at school. Parents were not happy, I mean, satisfied with the English school. They called the English school because it's a, you know, that, that everybody went there, spoke English. They wanted to teach mother language. So April 1907, the first Korean language school started in Hilo. Notice, they did not use Hangul Hakkyo. They used the Kugo Hakkyo. Hangul wasn't, Hangul, the word wasn't there in 1907. It was, it started to use the 1911. So that time they called it Kugo Hakkyo. Okay. Uh, slowly, all the plantation had a Kugo Hakkyo. So about 20 more schools came throughout the island. By 25, nine language schools left because the children are, you know, not interested. And that actually, the Jap Hawaii had a foreign language uh, school law change. It was very restrictive. So more, many, including Japanese and many language schools, were closed at the time. So by 20, 1928, about 732 students were in various Korean language schools. Whereas a public school, the regular school had about 1,700. So about 60% of the total Korean students actually went to language school. So here are some Google uh, Hakkyo pictures I can show you. This is the Koloa Kawai Island. They even had a school flag on the right, you can see. And please note the teachers with all the instruments. Okay, below, his school had a baseball team. So the language school was actually after after school program system. So because the parents are working in a plantation, so they had they spend a lot of time at the Kugo uh, Hakkyo. Kugo uh, Hakkyo was mostly affiliated with the uh, churches, and so th because the facility was available, so they used the churches and all that. Uh, Shinung, same name, was used by the Lilia Church, Korean, uh, Korean Christian Church. It started in 1936, but it lasted until 1950s. St. Luke's uh, Episcopal Church had their children's school. This is a Kiamoku Ch Church, Christ Church's uh, language school in 1938. Actually, Kiamoku's uh, church did not have a language school early because uh, um, Kiamoku Church shared uh, the Korean boarding school in the same compound, and the school taught the Korean, so church did not have to have a language school. That was the reason. This is the United Korean Students Association had, I mean, actually made a, published its own literature, literary book. And I don't know how long it lasted, but they tried. This is a Korean YMCA basketball team. Students' are annuals was studied. Okay. They even had a rural uh, Korean school association, and they had a conference. Okay, let's go to University of Hawaii. College of Hawaii started in 19... Well, the first Korean, the 31-year-old Oh Young-un, 1908 college, they studied. And the first, he, he, by the way, he changed his name, Cloud Owen. Young-un, okay? So you don't see an Oh Young-un name anymore in the his Korean history, always Cloud Owen, okay? That was, the Sungman, we actually joined the petition to create the University of Hawaii in 1919. 
and UH, the first Korean, was a Sogi Moon. 20s had a Ted Korean student. This is actually the top number four was Dr. Sungman Ri's signature. This is everybody went through. Uh, so this is a President Park Jung is monitor. So UH is the only university in America has a close relationship of two president of Korea. Sungman Wee, although he wasn't a, a president yet, but Dr. Sungman Wee petitioned for UH, and Maritor was done by Park Jung Hee. Do you know where Maritor is? Have you seen the Maritor? Please go outside, turn left, right behind the palm tree. Who cleaned the palm tree? KBFD PD Lee. Because Dr. Peck couldn't do it by himself, so we all came and cut the trees. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Actually, this building costed about a million dollars. The price went up more than twice, so it eventually became. In 1980, 1979, one million is just six million of today's dollar. Okay. One third came from the state of Hawaii, one third came from Republic of Korea. One third came from the second generation of a Korean in Hawaii. So each room has a who's who name uh, plaque under each room because the Korean second generation donated all that. Thank you. Thank you. Six foot note. The real building and the painting <laughs> was two million. <laughs> That's a 20 years later. 20 years later, exactly, but it cost more. So, so I, I hate to correct my <laughs> nunim. Anyway, I was just pointing out in 1998, they re-roofed the building and repainted it, and that cost $2 million. And one reason, we basically used up all of UH's maintenance budget. But I do want to point out the chairman of the Board of Regents was a man by the name of Donald Kim. <laughs> That's only the partial story. I, I can go on and on and on. Okay, just one thing. The roof was uh, built the traditional way in mud, jin hook, and lay the giwa, am giwa, sub giwa. Remember what I'm talking about? And engineer, American engineer said, no, no, no way. It won't last long. They wanted to nail it. No Korean tile maker wanted to make a nailing kind of a roof tile. So they decided to use the Japanese roof tile. When the Korean community learned the Center for Korean Studies top of their head will Japanese roof tile, you know what happened. <laughs> so they scrapped the plan and a couple of years later the, the, the construction company responsible for re replacing the roof went to Korea, and the Korean roof tile makers finally used the same style of a nailing system. That's it, cost the $2 million. Wow. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, now do I have my PPT? Good afternoon. My name is Mi Jung Park. I'm from the uh, Department of East Asian Languages and Literature. Do I have this? Okay, so. Okay, so uh, I was asked to present on the, uh, the following three areas, focusing on the three areas Korean language program at UH Manoa and Korean language flagship program at the UH Manoa and about Dr. Ho Min Son, Professor Emeritus of Korean. 
some of the grad students asked me after seeing the program if he will be presenting. I said, no, it's about him. So, um, yes. So in order to give you a better sense of where we stand as a Korean program in, the, uh, in America, I'd like to give you a brief outline of Korean language education overall in America. And in order to do that, I would like to share with you two important notions related to Korean language education. And one of them is Korean is a less commonly taught languages, language, and second one is Korean is a critical language. So less, the term less commonly taught language refers to a language that is not one of the most commonly studied language in uh, American uh, education system. And in America, um, all languages except English as an uh, in form of ESL, French, German, and Spanish are considered less commonly taught languages. And these are world languages that are uh, underrepresented in the uh, K-16 US education system. And approximately 90%, 91% of American college students taking uh, language classes take uh, French, German, Italian, or Spanish, while only 9% of them take non-Western European languages, such as Chinese, Arabic, Russian, and so on, despite the fact that the vast majority of the world population speak these languages. So um, critical languages are those that are less commonly taught languages in America's, American schools, but are essential for America's engagement with the rest of the world. And some of the examples are the following, including East A uh, some languages in East Asia and Pacific, South and Central Asia, and so on. And Korean is one of them, of course. And to give you a better understanding of where Korean uh, stands within the field of language education in America, um, I'd like to give you a little summary of 2016 MLA report, which is a modern language association, which focuses on enrollments uh, in languages other than uh, English in American colleges and universities. And this is based on fall 2016. So basically what this number tells you is that in between 2009 and 2013, all language classes in American colleges and universities other than English decreased by 6.7%, while some languages, including Korean, increased by 44.7%, which is a huge number. And at that time, the news was around all over the place. So everyone was speaking about Korean language at the time followed by uh, American Sign Language at 19%, Portuguese at 10 Chinese 2 And in two th between 2013 and 2016, the total enrollment decreased by 9.2% again, so further decrease. And yet two languages increase in enrollment, and the two of them is Japanese at 3% uh, and Korean at 13.7% again probably thanks to BTS and many other uh, K-pops. And the growth of Korean is particularly impressive according to this report. And when taking the long view, in the first MLA census taken back in 1958, Korean only had 26 students enrolled at the time. Okay, so this chart kind of shows, uh, it's kind of hard to read, but the uh, percentage of total language courses enrollment for the 15 most commonly taught languages in fall 2016. So remember, Korean started with 26 students, and back in 2016, it was considered one of the 15 most uh, mostly taught languages in America. And as you can see, um, despite the fact that uh, there was a tremendous growth in Korean enrollment over time, if you look at the total percentage, <clears throat> there are 50% of students taking language classes in American college take Spanish. And only 1% would choose Korean. That means we still have plenty of room for improvement and growth, despite the fact that we have shown a tremendous growth over the last 10 years or so. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a, a, a graph based on the MLA enrollment reports from 1958 in 2016. Unfortunately, 2016 report is the latest one, so we don't have any updates on that. And as you can see from the graph, there was a big jump in enrollment number starting from mid-90s. I'm not sure if that's the case, but it coincides with the beginning of Korean wave. So, but there, there must be many other factors too. 
And then another huge jump between 2000 and 2009 at 44%, as I mentioned previously. And this is a huge number. And once again, this is numbers taken for fall semesters only, not throughout the whole academic years. Okay? And although the number is steadily increasing overall, there is a big jump in certain time. And many believe this has something to do with the recent growing popularity of K-pop, K-drama, and so on. But there must be many other factors too. And according to uh, Wang 2015, based on an extensive survey, there must be some of the reasons for this recent growth. And one of them uh, includes <coughs> sorry, the growing popularity of K-pop again, and then economic growth of Korea and geopolitical status of Korea, okay. and, and um, Institution-specific factors, including curriculum development, uh, creation of Korean studies in many uh, institutions, community-based initiation, and so on. Don't mind? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. OK, then the question is, uh, who was the first one to start Korean language classes in America? And according to the record, Columbia started first in 1934 for just one year, sorry. And then they stopped until 1962. And then UC Berkeley and Hawaii started in the 40s, and then uh, Harvard University in the uh, 50s, and then Washington, Indiana University in the 60s, and many more to come in the later years. And um, as of now, out of 4,360 US colleges and universities, only 162 institutions are offering Korean classes regularly. We believe this is a huge achievement and still is a small number compared to the total number. But these are only, and there are only six institutions offering BA degree programs in Korean. Out of 162, only six offer BA degrees. So compared to 77 in Japanese and 84 in Chinese, this is still a small number. And UH Mano is the only university that offers all possible levels of languages from beginning to high advanced level linguistics, literature, culture, and uh, many more classes, both uh, at undergrad and graduate level. Okay? And we are proud of that, too. And now let's focus on Korean program at UH Manoa, per se. So Korean language instruction at UH Manoa first took place in the fall of 1946, one year right after the end of uh, World War II. And the uh, Korean language instruction took place in the Department of Asian Pacific Languages at the time with Mr. Kwan Du Park. Okay, that's the, the record that we have. Kwan Du Park was a KBS uh, third oh. graduate hmm. engineer. So we have a, a, a record history here. <laughs> and he was an architect who had no training in language pedagogy. And he's been teaching first and second year of Korean from 1946 to 1951. And from 1952, probably he quit teaching. And someone else shows in the record, which is K. Kim. We don't know who that is. Do you happen to know K. Kim? Between 61 and 62. And after that, for about 10 years, we have no record of who taught uh, all these classes. And only in 1962, uh, Peter H. Lee, who specializes in Korean mm -hmm. literature, was hired as the first tenure track faculty assistant professor in Korean. And after that, the Korean program has been allotted several tenure track positions, including professors Tong Jae Lee, Ho Min Sung, uh, Marshall Phil, Young Yee Kim, and many more, including myself. And then uh, uh, additional three non tenure track instructional faculty also joined the program later on. And until 1987, Korean classes were offered only to fulfill general education. But starting 1987, we established MA and PhD degree programs for Korean in linguistics and literature. And then in 1995, BA program in Korean. And then in 2007 and 8, we also launched MA and BA flagship in Korean for professionals. Okay? We also have minor and certificate in Korean too. No other universities in America offer this variety of programs other than UH Manoa. Okay, and we also offer a variety of courses, that probably the largest number of courses, uh, Korean courses in America. Which, uh, the catalog currently includes 37 undergrad level courses and 21 graduate level courses. And among them, nearly 30 undergrad and 14 graduate courses are regularly offered. That's a huge number of courses. 
And this is the, uh, a graph that shows our overall number of enrollment in China, Japanese, and Korean between 1946 and, and 2021. I have included Japanese and Chinese as well because uh, they are all housed in the same department. And also it's a good comparison to uh, among the three East Asian languages. As you can see from the chart, the Korean program started uh, to grow very slowly. The, the blue one is in Korean. And, and in the 90s, the, the program expanded uh, even more with the introduction of a Korean flagship program, both MA and BA program at the time. It, 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 that's around 2007 and 8. And uh, this is a point where the enrollment number for Koreans surpassed that of Chinese. And from that point on, we maintained pretty high number surpassing Chinese, which is very rare. Okay. And I would say that enrollment exploded in 2012 and 2013 alongside the growth of flagship programs and also the growing popularity of K-pop culture and K-drama. And the increase coincides with the national trend as well. The next one shows a, a number of majors in uh, Korean, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean between 2011 and 2022. As you can see, in the blue dots shows our Korean majors. So we currently have 125 as of today. Okay. Then uh, the Korean flagship was implemented as an integral component of the language flagship initiative created by NCEP uh, in the US DOD. And in 2002, NCEP awarded the first flagship grants for Korean, Arabic, Russian, and Chinese and UHM uh, uh, was selected for Korean. And during the time we, we started the Korean flagship program here, and we, we are the only Korean flagship in America. And in 2007, NCEP uh, transitioned all uh, non-degree program to BA program, and we were able to maintain both MA and BA for a while. And at the time, we also uh, established uh, the cent uh, Korean Language Flagship Center uh, that, uh, with the, uh, the director, Dr. Ho Min Son, who served for eight years as a director, and it was succeeded by Professor uh, Sang Yi Chan. Okay. And this, as I said, this is the only Korean flagship in America, and we it, this is a multi-million dollar uh, continual grants. We bring in roughly one million dollar, okay, every year to campus, Manuel campus. Okay. And uh, this is some of the characteristics of flagship, and their mission is global professionals. Uh, commanding a superior level of proficiency in critical language. Okay. And some, uh, some of the characteristics of flagship. Okay, since I don't have that much time, I would have to rush. Okay. And uh, the characteristic of flagship is that we do, in addition to the domestic program, we also have overseas components housed at Korea universities. So st students spend about a year at Korea universities. Okay. Uh, to, to summarize, the Korean language and linguistic program at UH Manoa is recognized as uh, one of the uh, long, uh, largest and most well-established academic program of its kind and I would, uh, outside of Korea. And the Korean program has made enormous progress from its inception to its productive place today, especially in language instruction and linguistic research. We also have Korean literature program, uh, which is uh, which the very first of its kind in America. It was established in 1962, and for 60 years, roughly 60 years, we only had one faculty managing all literature faculty. Professor Young Yi Kim was one of them. She retired last semester, and we were finally able to hire additional literature faculty in 2019. Unfortunately, after the retirement of Young Yi Kim, we were not able to bring additional position. So I'm just telling Peter, yeah, we are trying very hard to uh, hire one additional <laughs> faculty in Korean literature. Okay, so, so what is the key uh, to the success of Korean language program? Uh, there are many uh, factors, including external and institutional factors, but I have to say that one of them is uh, faculty. And, and I have to say that all of our faculty, Korean faculty, work so hard and they have uh, provided so many contribution to the program, but I have to say that the key faculty who established and nourished our Korean program at UH for over four decades is Professor Emeritus of Korean, Ho Min Son. So I would like to briefly just uh, tell you about Dr. Ho Min Son, who served at UH Mana for 43 years. 
And in case you didn't have the pleasure to meet him in person, these are some of the photos taken at, uh, while he was at UH Manoa. Okay, so um, these are some of the uh, credentials of Dr. Ho Min Sung. Okay, yeah, he received his BA degree in 56 when uh, many of you were not even born at the time. And then he was a professor at UH Manoa for 43 years and retired in 2015. Okay, and he, was, uh, he served in many important positions, including department chair, director of Center for Korean Studies, and the director of uh, the Language Flagship Center, too. He received uh, many, uh, he, he had uh, many different positions, and also he was one of the founder of the uh, CLEAR, which is very important uh, endeavor. So under the, uh, the grant of Korea Foundation, and under his leadership, we were able to produce 20 volumes of textbook for language skills, and six volumes of textbook for content training. And I have to say this is FII and off the record, but roughly 25% of revenue created by UH Press is coming from this book series. And nearly 80 to 90% of all colleges in America are using our textbooks. So it's a big achievement. Okay, and he also received uh, several, uh, he uh, produced, he was chair of a PhD a dissertation committee for 40 students. I'm just giving you some of the points. He produced 125 uh, presentations, including keynotes, 17 single and co-author books, uh, eight edited books, 108 articles, eight book reviews, and so many different titles. And received so many uh, prizes, including presidential award twice, and then uh, Dongseong Academy Prize, 2005 Medal of Excellence in Research at UH Manoa, okay? Board of Regents, and many other uh, prizes. So I'd like to um, wrap up this presentation um, by sharing some of uh, something that Dr. Sun presented in 2015 ATK conference to celebrate his uh, retirement. So he shared this Haja Sangho to summarize lessons he learned during his 43 long years of service and career at UH Manoa. So there are many of them, and so I said, where there is a will, there is a way, and a thirsty person digs a well, <laughs> strike while the iron is hot, well begun is half done, and sincerity moves heaven, interpersonal harmony is everything, but most importantly, bongo changshin, which means innovations through the old. So it was really touching when he presented this. To summarize his 43 years of service at UH Manoa. Okay, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Actually, Professor Mi Jung Park is uh, on her sabbatical this year, but she generously agreed to give this presentation without being pushed. So, thank you very much. Next, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. First of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. I'm going to be the voice for David and his family today to tell a story of a man who was a lifelong scholar, a passionate nationalist, and a husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. And my voice will get stronger as we go. <laughs> it's a little shaky right now. It's a story of his passion, his perseverance, and his commitment to Korea. It's interesting, as I was listening to these first two presentations, there's a couple of places in my presentation that it dovetails with what's happening. So when that happens, I'll bring that to your attention. First of all, this story, much like the early years in Hawaii, the story with Bong begins with his birth in 1914. He was born on a farm owned by his family in a small village north of the 138th parallel, which was then under Japanese sovereignty. In 1934, he left Korea for Japan, 20 years old. Four years later, he had graduated from the university in Tokyo. Those, thank you. <laughs> Those early years of growing up during Japanese occupation and the early studies in Japan helped 
we believe, to put him on this path of being a passionate nationalist and a strong supporter of Korean independence and sovereignty. Then, in 1938, he arrived in the United States on a student visa and a Japanese passport. And the context of this is that during that time, he was one of the few Korean immigrants who came to the US between 1910 and 1945. But because the US was officially banned as the, you couldn't come directly from Korea, you had to come through Japan because the US recognized Japan's jurisdiction over Korea. So he came on the Japanese passport. He lived in California from 1938 to 46. He went to Pasadena College, he went to LA City College, he went to Chaplin, Chapman College, and then he went to the University of California, Berkeley. He received two degrees while he was there studying. And this is where the other part segues or crosses with the language. Now this is what we have heard and what we have while he was working at UC Berkeley, and this was the early 40s, 41, 42, 43, he discovered that there were courses offered in Chinese and Mongolian, but not Korean. So he went to the department head and was told there's no budget for this fringe course offering the Korean language. So he said, much to some of the sayings that we just saw, he volunteered to hold the class. He needed 15 students, so he, at the time he was teaching a Japanese class because they couldn't have Japanese instructors at that time in the early 40s. So he got some of his 17 students from his other class to sign up for the Korean class. He created his own Korean textbook called the Korean Reader. He wrote it out himself, and then had it published by the University of California Press. So this is the story that we heard. There may be some discrepancies there, but we do have the book that shows this. It was one of the first Korean um, language programs, and UC Berkeley went on, of course. It doesn't sound as robust as it is here in University of Hawaii, but certainly by 1980, they had three separate levels for their increase in students. Also during 41 to 42, he was employed part-time by the Office of War Information in San Francisco. So he taught Japanese to Army personnel in connection with the Army specialized training. Then in 1946, Bong Yan was sent with his family to Korea, which meant Cora, David, and Francis, who is deceased, the other son. He was a civilian employee for the War Department, and he worked for an organization known as the American Military Government in South Korea. There he was a specialist in political education and an advisor to the Department of Public Information. So for two years, he worked with Korea and he worked with the American government. In 1948, once the Republic of South Korea was established, his employment ended, so he and his family returned to the United States to San Francisco. And as a kind of an aside to this, the Cora was five, David was three, and Francis, the younger brother was two. So the family was very young that they went to Korea during this time. So his early years were full of activities with his studies, the university work, his family, growing new family, and his work with Korea and the American government. <clears throat> this portion of the story is important to remember because it was about to change. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, American fears of internal US communist subversion reached a nearly hysterical pitch. Government loyalty boards investigated federal employees. They were asking what books and magazines were being read. 
They were, what unions do you belong to? What civic organizations? Things of those matter. This was the America that Bong returned to in 1948. So Bong and his young family returned to San Francisco, and then within the next year to two, they moved to Seattle to be near longtime friends. <clears throat> and he had a job teaching at Seattle Pacific. So in late 48, early 49, he was teaching, and he met with friends and families, and as always, due to his passion about Korea, he would discuss Korea and the political environment. Whether it was his association with the Korean friends, whether it was his work with the government, whatever it was, one night in 1950, Bong was taken to the immigration office for questioning. He was interrogated, labeled a communist, and threatened with deportation. This was to begin his saga of continuing to fight to stay in the United States through eight to 10 years of deportation hearings. The Choi family life, <coughs> sorry, I, <laughs> the Choi family life changed during this time. Bong wasn't able to get any university or teaching position. The wife and his family lived under constant fear now, the children weren't told about the deportation threat. So the, in the, when we talk as a family today, they do not really know any of this. But they did know that something was wrong because their father wasn't working at the jobs. He was working selling Fords and house painting to help make some of the ends meet. Now, along this same time, Mrs. Lehman of San Francisco read in the newspapers, the San Francisco Chronicle, that he'd been charged with being a communist about the deportation hearings. She wrote to ask him if there was anything that could be done. And Mrs. Lehman was a benefactor of many people at the university, some of the arts world in UC Berkeley. So she read, she had, read about it, she wrote to ask him, is there anything I can do to help? And therein began the friendship and the assistance for Bong and his family. So as Bong says, I had my deportation hearings. It was read by Mrs. Lehman in the paper who I came to call my American mother. She always helped underdogs in trouble. I had taught their son in Japanese at Berkeley and she knew my cause. So after the hearing started, he resigned from Seattle Pacific, moved back to Berkeley, California. Ms. Mrs. Lehman was be the benefactor and helped him with monetary and emotional assistance. And um, she hired the lawyers for all of his deportation hearings. So the family owes her a, a lot of gratitude for helping the family through that time. Bong was finally cleared of communist charges. In 1964, then, he obtained permanent residency. He did kind of resist having a permanent residency, you know, a US citizen, because of his, he really wanted to remain a Korean in all of the ways. But because of all of the troubles that he'd been through, he went ahead and he did become a permanent residency in the United States. This shows the three children. This is when they were uh, coming back from Korea. And then this just shows that they did have some good times during those years. This is Mrs. Lehman. This is David and the younger son, Francis. And then this was some of the dinner parties that they used to have, uh, where the, they lived in Berkeley, so they'd have the dinner parties, and people would come from San Francisco and Berkeley. Once clear to the threat of deportation, the one thing Bong and his wife, they opened a Korean restaurant in Berkeley called the Korean Inn, where she cooked and managed a small staff, and he handled all the others. 
This restaurant was a success by the late 60s and 70s. And then in 71, Bong's wife, Zhang Suk Choi, passed away from cancer. The restaurant was sold. The children were now married and having grandchildren. And so a new chapter was starting. And this 1971 death of his wife is what prompted the very first donation because he knew that the building, the center, was being built. So David and Francis, the brother, and Bong all put together to help with the building fund. So he's believed in the center for years. So once this was all done and the mother passed away, he remarried and his wife, Yang Jia Choi, went on for the rest of um, his life. The one thing that did happen through all of this is that he continued to read, study, write. His scholarly research was to record Korean history and a Korean American history. So he had three books, 1971, Korea, a History, Koreans in America, 1979, and the one that his real passion was, a history of Korean unification movement in 1984. He retired in 70, 1976, but he did guest lectures. He received an honorary doctorate and medals from the South Korean government. He continued his research of political differences of governments around the world, continued his writing, he mentored a number of Korean students. When I was going through a lot of his books and papers, there were dissertations, there were books, then they were sending them to him to please read, please go through, please edit. And we found a lot of those in his things. Hopefully he sent some of it back, but <laughs> we did find some of the papers. His library at his home was over a thousand books. Korean, all the different governments of different countries. In 1988, he did travel to South Korea for the celebration of the translation of his book, The History of Korean Unification Movement. So that book is translated into Korea. Excuse me, into Korea. Bong passed away in 2005. According to his wishes, he was cremated, and his remains rest in the Daejeon National Cemetery, South Korea. Also, in accordance with his wishes, he stipulated that one half of the proceeds of the family home in Berkeley be donated to the University of Hawaii, which is why we're here. <laughs> so he believed in it to begin with, and he believed in it through all of his time. And one of the reasons, someone asked me one time, one of the family members said, well, why University of Hawaii? And it was because it was a focus of Korean studies. It wasn't just Asian, not just, it wasn't Asian studies. It was a focus on Korea and all of the things that made Korea special in its own without being lumped in as a fringe language from years and years ago. I'd like to finish. First, I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> I'd like to finish with what? And I wasn't going to get emotional. <laughs> One of the grandchildren, Mike Choi, Pete's brother, said, when I was in elementary school, we used to go visit Grandpa Bong. He used to take us on walks, Pete and I. I hated going up and down the streets of the Tamil Pius neighborhood in Berkeley. But these <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> these interactions were truly priceless. When I wanted to quit walking, he would quietly remind me 
of the importance of not giving up to finish what I started about commitment. Although he didn't say much, he made a big impact on me as an elementary child. Even with less frequent walks, the interactions with him were still meaningful. So at a teary ending, <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, aloha, aloha kako. Uh, my task was to talk about the two first historians we had at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. I'm just going to focus on their early years, uh, in part because he told me I could only talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, just to give you a little background, um, in 1966, I came to Hawaii as a Peace Corps volunteer. So I was well aware of the strengths of the islands. And uh, so when I finished my Peace Corps term, uh, I was confronted with the idea that I wanted to go to graduate school. And I fished around, and I chose UH. And there's a lot of reasons why I chose UH. But in 1962, I think it was mentioned the East West Center started here. And suddenly, Hawaii is on the map in terms of being a place to study Asia. East Asia in particular. And that was sort of an incentive. But it was also during my Peace Corps orientation in Hilo, Glenn Page came out from Princeton and talked to us. He, he just mesmerized us because when Glenn gets excited, you, you listen. And so he became a, a supporter of uh, coming to Hawaii. Uh, at the same time, all the mainland schools that I looked at, there was one in Boston, another one in, where'd you go to college? Uh, anyway, one, one in Columbia, or, or I guess that was it. They said, fine, come in the fall. But I wanted to start right away. And Hawaii said, sure, come in January. It was cold in the East Coast, and Hawaii was very inviting. And so that also obviously had an impact. But I think it was really the fact that Hawaii already, in 1968, had five key specialists in Korean studies, and, it, and Glenn Page was one of them. And no other campus on the mainland could match that. In fact, I think Columbia had one, Harvard had one and a half, uh, Washington was just starting, so Hawaii clearly was, was on the ground floor. And so I, I, I came out here, and when I arrived, I discovered that the Ford Foundation was, was awarding five different campuses uh, special grants to promote a, uh, Korean studies. And it was, you know, I think it was Washington and uh, Harvard and Columbia, uh, was it maybe Princeton, I forget, and then of course Hawaii. So, I mean, obviously it seemed to me Hawaii was a place to be. And so I, that's, that's sort of the background to how I got out here. Now we want to talk about Hugh Kong, not about me. And uh, you included. I was. I was included there. Anyway, I, I, I was a grad student at this point. And, and uh, so I, I was watching the whole center begin to develop from a graduate student's point of view. And uh, first of all, Hugh came to Hawaii in 1965. And I have, he kind of maybe looked like that. Uh, that's a picture that uh, Sanya found in a newspaper uh, of, of Hugh in uh, I mean, it looks like he was a, a kid. Pardon? Oh, who gave it to you? Oh, this one is, okay. I was thinking this one was doctored. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so Hugh uh, comes out here, and uh, I think if you read his biography in the, the, the book that, that Harrison produced, it tells quite a lot about him and how he got here. So I'm not going to really uh, cover that in any detail. But... Uh, what, what, I, what I specifically remember is, is Hugh was an amazingly supportive person. He really embraced Korean studies. And this is, again, at 68. And he, he emerges as a key faculty member in the, Korean, in the history department, uh, UH history department. And uh, history at that point was really growing solid. 
they had like three or four people in Chinese history, three or four people in Japanese history, and soon they were going to have two in Korean history, something they, they, they can't match today. Anyway, Hugh came, Hugh initially came to the United States in 1954, and he went to Berea College. Does anybody know where Berea College is? It's on the outskirts of Kentucky, eastern, eastern Kentucky. And as he says, he went to a hilly-billy college. <laughs> but, but Berea actually is, is a really, really good liberal arts school. And uh, is, everybody there had to work. And, and uh, he, he started off there. And when he finished at Berea, he went to uh, Chicago for grad school. And he studied there for a couple of years, got his MA. And he was really well trained in Chicago. There was a very famous Chinese scholar by the name of Ho Peng Di, who was one of his uh, mentors. And then he goes to Washington and gets his PhD in Washington. And anyway, Hugh can tell you, if you read Hugh's biography or his story, he talks about that and how he went from a hillbilly, hillbilly college to uh, Chicago to Washington, and then he was going to be sent to the middle of the Pacific, and he really had some, some doubts. But he, he came, anyway. And he, he, as I say, he quickly became a key member of the, the UH faculty, the history faculty. And Hugh's, Hugh's strength is, I guess you could say he was trilingual, because he was fluent in Japanese, fluent in Kyungsang Korean, and he, he, I think he speaks pretty good English. So anyway, <laughs> there was sort of that combination. Uh, and and, and this, this, this ability in these languages also enabled him to be very generous in terms of trying to train other people. And, and, and he had always, always had lots of time for people. He was a collaborator, not a collaborator in terms of collaborating. But anyway, but what I mean by a collaborator is he, he worked with people. He was, he, he was very uh, Rotarian, shall we say. He was very generous. He, he, he liked to work with people. He uh, liked to, to uh, bring in as many people as possible to develop things. And I think he did a lot to put Korean studies in Hawaii on the main stage. And again, read his biography, read his, his essay. He, he talks about what he did. But he ends up playing a prominent role, not only here in Hawaii, but also on the mainland and in Korea. And he becomes a very good conduit between Korea and the United States. We talked earlier about uh, who, who envisioned this idea of this building. And it, it could have been Hugh, it could have been any number of people, but it was this idea of he was going back and forth. And remember, in 1969, you didn't have a lot of jets going back and forth. You couldn't even make a phone call back and forth. It's not like now. And, and he, was, he actually, though, went there and, and he gained the respect of, of scholars in Korea, on the mainland, and of course, here in Hawaii. And I think Harrison mentioned this, but one, one of his early great um, contributions was this conference called Traditional Culture in Korea, called Traditional Culture and Society in Korea. And this, is an ex this little booklet was actually published in 1975. But it was the first major Korean studies conference in the United States, held right here. It was actually held right over there at the East West Center. And he brought scholars from Japan, Korea, China, and he had a, an amazing dialogue. I forget the final dinner, but that's all right. I, he, he, he just brought these people together, and they collaborated, and they talked. Now, his publications, I just want to briefly mention them. Uh, you can see he's, he's, he's already helping to, to be, put Korean history on the map. But I, his, probably his two most influential publications in terms of Korean studies uh, in history was these two articles in the Journal of Asian Studies. One came out in 1974, one came out in 1977. And for those of you who aren't aware, uh, the Journal of uh, Asian Studies is the preeminent journal of, of, of Asian studies in general. And Korea had very, very few articles published in that journal. Hughes was one of the first ones to come through. And, and he really puts suddenly Korean studies in the forefront, and he puts the University of Hawaii in the forefront with these two articles. And um, they're, they're both very, um, they, they grow out of his uh, research, but they, they are, they're very, very uh, well-written, well-researched, and suddenly people are, are beginning to look at, at Korean studies. We had people like uh, Gary Ledger at uh, Columbia, um, Ed Wagner at Harvard, but this is the first time we've had something in the Journal of Korean Studies among Korean specialists. So that was sort of a major breakthrough. 
Um, this one, of course, was the traditional society and culture, which, which he also produced. And uh, so, so what I see in Hugh is he tries to bring many people to the table. He tries to include Japanese specialists, Chinese specialists, Korean specialists. And uh, he, he's trying to make a home for Korean studies. And this, of course, is ultimately embodied here in uh, this whole development of the Center for Korean Studies. Hugh was very good in bringing people in. And if you read his article again, he'll talk about what he did in terms of bringing folks in. The uh, second person I want to talk to about is Young Ho Che. And uh, we couldn't find any real, you, ha you had a couple of early pictures later I saw up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Young Ho, in many respects, compliments Hugh. Uh, Young Ho uh, arrives here in Hawaii in 1970. Hugh came in 65, Young Ho comes in 70. And it really shows you how, how the University of Hawaii was really behind developing history, especially Korean history, because we got two strong people right off of the start. Uh, in fact, the University, uh, University of Hawaii was the only university to have two historians of Korea for close to maybe 30 years. And ironically, both of them were in the far more important part of early Korean history, not this modern stuff. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, sorry, Gary. sorry. And, and, and I say both, both were basically pre-modern uh, scholars. Uh, Young Ho, in many respects, was very similar to Hugh. Young Ho had, uh, had uh, got his PhD from Colum uh, uh, Chicago. Chicago. Columbia, Chicago, what's the difference? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Chicago. And, and, and as I say, he was a pre-modern specialist, and Young Ho likewise was, likewise was trilingual. Uh, he also spoke Kyungsang Do Korean, uh, but his, his, his was a little more, a little better. And then uh, he was also fluent in Japanese and, of course, English. And like, like Hugh, he focused on institutional history, and uh, he had very close ties with scholars in China, uh, Korea, and to a certain degree in, in Japan. And one of Hugh's, uh, one of Young Ho's great strengths was he welcomed people. And uh, he, he and his wife were often entertaining people in their homes, wherever they, wherever they lived. Uh, and uh, they, they really embraced visitors. If, if Dr. An, if you had come to uh, Korea, uh, come to Hawaii in 1968, I can, or 1975, I can assure you they would have had you over to their house for dinner. Uh, they were that kind of people. And so that was a very informal way to meet all sorts of different people, and uh, they're the, the very, very open in that way. But they also were quite different. Uh, Young Ho chose to focus on Chosun history, which is post uh, basically uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century. Uh, Hugh, of course, was focusing more on early, and so they complement each other that way. Uh, but they're also very different in the fact that Hugh seemed to have a much stronger focus on joining people internationally. And, and working in an international environment, whereas Young Ho increasingly began to turn and focus on Hawaii, and focuses on, on things in Hawaii. And as Harrison mentioned, he, he did that wonderful movement in 1978 to support Korean immigrants. So again, make sure you read Young Ho's article. It really uh, captures where, where he was thinking. Uh, bo both of them uh, came to Hawaii as Korean studies was taking off. And so they helped give a firm foundation for the program, Korean studies in Hawaii, and ultimately in the United States. As I say, they really complemented each other. Uh, these were some of the early articles that, that uh, Young Ho did. And uh, again, I want to point to the fact that he also had an article in the Journal of Asian Studies. Uh, Hugh had one in, the, in, in, one, in 1974. Young Ho also had one in 1974. So again, Hawaii is really on the map in terms of, of Korean studies development. Uh, Young Ho, as I said, really became very much involved in the Korean community in Hawaii. And although I don't list it up here, when we had the centennial celebration of Korean immigration, he edited a book, he, he oversaw a conference and then edited a book from, uh, called From the Land of the Hibiscus. And it's, it's talking about early Korean immigrants in the islands. And it's, it's still a major uh, work we have to deal with that particular thing. So essentially, in, in conclusion, I just want to say how 
they, two men really complemented each other. And they, they, as I said, Hugh was more international uh, and more involved in bringing in people from around, whereas Young Ho was focusing increasingly more on the community. But both were well-respected in Korea, well-respected on the mainland, and of course, well-respected here. Anyway, thanks a lot, and uh, any questions, I'll be happy to explain later. Well, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> You've heard from the, the historians. It's, this is a, it's a hard act to follow, uh, Ned and Harrison. But I do want to point out that there are others. This panel started with an urban planner, right? <laughs> and it's going to be closed with an urban planner, right? <laughs> Well, as many of you may know, uh, Professor Desoksa passed away last week in California. I spoke with his son, Maurice, um, who told me that up until his death, he remained healthy and engaged and lived a good, active life. You know, I, I called Maurice on the very day that Dr. Sub passed away because I had hoped to speak with him in person, and he didn't answer my email message. And, and so I spoke with Maurice in, in preparation for this um, 50th anniversary event. And I was very saddened to learn uh, of his passing. And on behalf of the center, the University of Hawaii, and our extended ohana and community, uh, we offer our deepest condolences to Mrs. Saw and the family, and I hope we can present to her the, the plaque that, that was given. Well, I'm very pleased and honored to have been asked to say a few words about um, Professor Saw, who I first met in 1984 when I was a young starting assistant professor at the University of Hawaii. I had just moved to Honolulu from uh, Boston. Um, and uh, I, I met him and I, I recall him as a very kind, generous person, one who advised me when I was first starting my academic career and also my own research in Korea on urbanization and urban planning. And so he really supported me in my first Fulbright to, uh, to, to Korea. Back then, they gave these three-year serial grant programs where you could take an entire year and spread it over three years. That was great. I love that because it let me go for three years. I think because of me, they got rid of the program. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, Professor Saw, like my own father, was born in North Korea in 1931 and came to the United States for college and graduate school in the 1950s. Professor Saw attended Texas Christian University and then went on to get a master's degree from Indiana University and then a PhD from Columbia in uh, 
1964. You know, he started uh, as a professor, assistant professor at uh, University of Houston. You know, that's the other UH. Uh, and, and he worked uh, in Texas from 1965 to 1971 before coming to the University of Hawaii, the real UH, right, uh, in 1972, uh, where he um, remained as a professor of political science uh, until he retired. Dr. Sa was the founding director of the Center for Korean Studies. Uh, and as we heard this morning, or this, after, this afternoon, uh, with support from the legislature and approval of the University of Hawaii Board of Regents and the generous contributions and involvement of many people from Korea, from the U.S., uh, Koreans, Korean Americans, and individuals who are really Korean at heart, uh, the center was created in 1972, and this magnificent, beautiful building, really the, the jewel box of the campus, uh, was, uh, was built along with many research, educational, and outreach uh, programs. When I was vice chancellor for the Manoa campus, I reviewed many area studies programs. And the Center for Korean Studies was always at the very top. You know, in terms of all the metrics uh, that we use for evaluation. It's not just about the building and the endowments, but it's about the stuff that really matters. The scholarship and academic productivity of the faculty. Uh, the center is not just the jewel box of the campus, but it's also the model, the shining example, the success story for what area studies can be and should be in terms of teaching and research and outreach and dissemination of knowledge. And a lot of that has to do with publications and the journal. Um, the first issue of Korean Studies was published in 1977. And in the introduction, Dr. Sa wrote, the importance of Korea as a pivot for many phases of East Asian studies has been amply shown. The basic case for Korean studies no longer has to be made. Korea has become accepted as a unique and important study area in the academic world. You know, he wrote these words back in 1977. You know, at that time, there was no scholarly English language journal on Korean studies. Uh, when the journal was launched, uh, Dr. Sa pointed out that, quote, while several attempts have been made, none have survived the test of time and none have been able to maintain the high standards of scholarship. You know, I think he would have been very proud to see the journal today and how the center has stood the test of time and exceeded the high standards of scholarship due to the continued and growing involvement of many scholars and researchers who have contributed to the journal, the occasional papers, the conferences, the workshop proceedings, and so many uh, book projects. Dr. Sa was committed to scholarship because he understood 
the value of research and publications. I mean, he's best known for his books on Kim Il-sung and the communist movement and, and, these, and other books which have been published by leading presses across the world and translated into different like Korean and Russian and German. Um, he was the foremost authority on Kim Il-sung and North Korea and was one of the first to really publish scholarly works on these topics. Uh, and in doing so, he drew international attention to North Korea, Korea, Northeast Asia, the United States, and Hawaii, and the University of Hawaii. You know, his pioneering work has stood the test of time, and it, continu and it continues to be read, uh, discussed, critiqued, uh, debated, updated, and built on. Like this building or our Korean Studies journal, Professor Sa served to create a sound, stable foundation for the continued growth and development of Korean studies. Uh, in this beautiful, quiet corner of the Manoa campus, Dr. Sa led us and many of the founding members of the center, who I had the privilege to meet and interact with um, over the years and it includes people like Woody Pitts and Herb Berenger and George Wan and Glenn Page and Chung Lee and so many others. Uh, uh, Donald Kim and Dewey Kim uh, and many of you are in this room here too. Um, to learn about Korea, to launch research projects, to meet and interact with many scholars and researchers and to participate in many academic and community programs on Korea and Hawaii and beyond. I asked a, a friend, he's a retired professor in political science who had an office next door to, doc, uh, to Desok about him. And what he said to me was that Desok was well respected in political science that he was quiet and understated and thoughtful and a wonderful colleague who was perhaps better known internationally than on the Manoa campus. And in some ways, I see that. Desuk led his actions, his publications, his behind the scenes work speak volumes to his commitment to scholarship engagement uh, in Korean studies. I recall uh, he served on the Hawaii uh, Convention Center Authority, and he had asked me to review the traffic studies. And I remember having a deep discussion with him about that, because everything comes down to traffic. Can you have parking or no? Uh, it, but he helped to really facilitate and build that center and connect Hawaii to the rest of the world. So I, like many of us, appreciate his interest in promoting not just Korean studies, but interdisciplinary research and his ability to bring people of diverse talents and backgrounds and politics and helping to facilitate uh, continued growth, change, evolution, and understanding. And I think you will be long remembered for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give a big round of applause one more time to our wonderful speakers today. We have around 10 minutes left. So I think we had better use this time very effectively. So I'd like to 
I uh, ask you to raise your hand if you have any question. After uh, receiving a couple, of, a couple of questions, then I will ask uh, the speaker to respond to that. So if you have any question, please uh, to direct who, uh, you know, to whom it is uh, actually directed. So any questions? Or you may also you know, uh, comment on any point that has been raised as well. Excuse me, I will just talk while I'm sitting. My name is Son of Lee. I happen to be here. Uh, first of all, my condolence for Dr. Sa. I came here in 1986 under the privilege of a visiting professorship while I was uh, teaching at NYU and working with the Asia Society in New York. And I think uh, in 1972, Dr. Schultz, do you remember, Dr. Page organized the World Peace Conference. I brought my dance company, I performed here. So this is like, uh, now I moved to Hawaii to live. So this is very interesting. Yesterday happened to be called here, and the lady told me 50th anniversary today. So I'm very honored to be here today and listening all the story behind Center for Korean Studies. And I feel like I was a part of it. And I'm very glad was able to hear all the speakers' note, and especially Dr. Carl Kim, I agree with the Dr. Saul. He was a really incredible person. I met him in Korea and everything. He's, he was something else. He's the kind of guy we will put together, make it happen. So now I'm here. After the COVID-19 is kind of down, I hope Center for Korean Studies start to organize, do more lively presentations and so on. I hope I can be part of this Center for Korean Studies. Thank you for organizing this wonderful conference. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any other comments or questions? Yes? Um, thank you very much for today. Um, I am a UH graduate from many, many decades ago. Anyways, um, I just had a particular question. In light of the Russian war in Ukraine, there has been a lot more attention on the geopolitical issues in Northeast Asia. And I found it to be very interesting that um, Korean studies was still very small compared to Chinese and Japanese studies. Is there a possibility in the future that their Center for Japanese Studies and Chinese Studies perhaps could collaborate together with the Center for Korean Studies in terms of assessing um, geopolitical risks in Far East Asia, especially because the Biden you know, administration has set a lot more focus on the Korean Peninsula, including inclusion with NATO. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will take some more questions. Any other comments? OK. Then. Can anybody respond? I will start, yeah. Uh, actually, as you know, uh, at the University of Hawaii, uh, Manoa, we have a School of Pacific Asian Studies, which have a, a eight area studies center and two academic departments. And the uh, Center for Chinese Studies, Center for Japanese Studies are part of those uh, uh, school. And I had chaired the School of Pacific Asian Studies last year. And uh, we actually uh, have a very close uh, relationship with all center. And now I realize Associate Director of the Center for Japanese Studies is sitting next to you, Kei uh, Satsuma. Yeah, and uh, we had a, a Director of the Center for Japanese Studies and Center for Chinese Studies uh, during lunchtime and the first part of this event. And uh, we have been organizing uh, many events and we'll be working together on many uh, fronts. And uh, probably uh, we will have a 
chance to collaborate on uh, kind of contemporary issues as well. So stay tuned. So any other thing that you want to add? Otherwise, I will ask uh, whether there's anybody. So I think this is a good time for me to ask uh, Professor and former director Young Yee Kim to say a few words. That's a surprise. <laughs> I think you are good at making surprises. Um, my tenure uh, at the centers as, yeah, as a director, it, it was not long. I served one term. And when Harrison asked us to write about our experiences at the center, the first thing that came to my mind was it was a privilege to serve um, the, uh, our faculty and students and community at large. And I have grown so much after my experience at the center. My radius of contact with people really expanded, and um, as a Korean literature specialist, our uh, kind of range of activities has been recognized as a small, nothing to do with what has happening in the actual life outside academia. But my um, responsibilities at the center taught me we cannot really live within this cocoon of scholarship. And actually, by serving these larger communities, I have discovered the importance of our being here in Honolulu as the hub for yeah, uh, the incorporating the human resources outside the campus. And I was really um, the, uh, impressed by non-academicians' interest in the study of Korean um, culture, history, people, arts, humanities, you name it. And especially those in Korea um, were really inspiration for me to work for raising uh, one million dollar for our endowed chair. I completed it, which was initiated by Dr. Ho Min Son, and then I was able to raise more funds for faculty research. Most of it came from Korean supporters. So what I is the, uh, hoped uh, from now on for the center's growth and expansion and contribution, open up more forums, more platform, and um, the, uh, welcome anybody. And we are living in the global dia era, and I hope the Center for Korean Studies becomes the leader in this new era and then prosper until we celebrate centennial within 50 years. And thank you very much. And as I listened all these presentations, I became so much impressed by this behind the scenes people's work. It's amazing, especially look at uh, this uh, the uh, choice. I never knew about your background. And Taki Murabayashi, my uh, sonbe, and I knew, <laughs> I, have, I have known her over 40 years, since our college years. And I really appreciate uh, Professor Mi Jung Park, 
who is really the mainstay of East Asian uh, Department of Asian Languages and Literatures. It's going through growing pains, and she is the mainstay of the department, and really appreciate, along with Professor Mary Kim, who is associate chair, and um, also uh, I have known uh, the Ned for over 26 years uh, since our association at the center, and I know his interest in the community, um, the uh, centennial of immigration and so on. And that was the first time I realized that this academic unit can be tied, linked to the community so closely in celebration of our ancestors um, under Japanese colonial rule. And also um, the, uh, let me see, okay, uh, Carl Her? Kim, yes. And um, the association with him also began when I joined the, uh, 26 years ago to the center's uh, the, uh, activities. And uh, his community work is also very much um, uh, cutting edge. And I hear about him by reading advertiser. You know, he was, <laughs> he was often the guest writers. So all of these illuminaries today, I think you made my day. And I'm so proud of all of our accomplishments and also our future visions to serve larger communities beyond Honolulu, probably some unknown countries in the world. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Peck. Thank you. It, it is impromptu kind of <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very yeah. much. Good. Actually, uh, the most recent, recent addition to the Center for Korean Studies faculty was uh, Professor David Krilokoski. Uh, do we have him here? Ah, he left. I'm sorry. I thought he is around. Okay, so we are kind of we have a ancient, you know, history uh, part of uh, our senior professors, but we also see very new, young, new generations growing, and more uh, faculty members and more uh, scholars who are among you uh, will be joining this uh, very important historical adventure and project. So I. I'm sure we will continue this. In the interest of time, I think we should conclude this very soon, unless you have any urgent remark to make. Then let me ask our Dean Peter and I to say a very brief uh, observation, and then I will give the uh, microphone back to the MCs. Well, I wasn't prepared to make an observation, but I will say, um I actually had a meeting at three, but I canceled it because uh, this was so fascinating to me. And I've learned myself so much about the center and the, and the deep scholarly roots of Korean studies here today. And um, I'm responsible now as the administrator in charge of the School of Pacific and Asian Studies in this larger college for the future. And so I'm listening very carefully. And as we emerge out of the pandemic, and as our budget begins to improve, I can assure you that in the college, we will continue to prioritize the center, the center's work, and the larger scholarly project of focusing on Korea. So thank you. Thank you very much. Please, uh, again, give a big uh, round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us and making this celebration very special. It is true that we have this beautiful building, but I think the essence of the Center for Korea Studies are its people. So we've heard some interesting um, stories about you know, those people who are just absolutely remarkable and dedicated and fascinating. So thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to, again, ask you to uh, watch us with lots of affection and also with lots of support as the center 
now takes our step forward to the next decade with um, new people, more younger, um, but equally remarkable and um, really productive scholars who are dedicated to their work. So thank you very much. And um, we are, again, very grateful for everybody who joined us and everybody who worked so hard to put this together and uh, President An for joining us all the way from Korea. I should maybe ask you to make some final remark and maybe some, some pledge of support. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I tried. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, okay, when uh, Taehyung asked me to uh, I mean, serve as a chair of the organizing committee a couple of years ago, of course I said no, you don't have any right to ask me because you are like nine months older than I am. <laughs> so, uh, and then actually the COVID-19 hit, right? So we actually have to, you know, postpone everything and even like, like twice and even early in this year, we didn't know where Actually, we can have in person, you know, this 50th anniversary. So we set the date, and then uh, I think uh, it's a big success. I mean, people here. I mean, we. I mean, really. I mean, I said already said uh, we are on a dream team. We are CKS, and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this uh, event. And this is really memorable because this is a first actually in person event, right? I mean, with, uh, with I mean without any hybrid actually com uh, component first uh, event uh, since the pandemic. So let's have more parties and more events okay, in the future. That concludes the event. Thank you very much. Okay.